The first time I met Amanda, she struck me as being a little bit selfish, you know, the kind of girl that most guys fall for the first time around. Clingy, needy. I say this because there just came a time period where Warren was not around like he used to be. When I would ask where he was, he was always at Amanda's place or with her and her friends. Not a big deal in my book. It happens to every boy as he becomes a man. He finds a girl and the two of them start to prioritize their time over family. However, I did notice that she didn't care much for being around any of us. She always wanted to pull him away from his support structure and that gave me pause. Understand that a person who loves you wants to know your family. They want to understand where you come from. A person using you, well, they just need you. Fast forward, Gordon and Liz are heading to Pine Bluff for the weekend. She had a childhood friend whose son was a coach for one of the historically black colleges and universities, and he was getting an award. He insisted that his Auntie Liz be there, so Gordon was taking her there. The two of them would go to the ceremony and catch the football game, then head back on Monday morning. Now let me say this, I didn't know anything about the party being planned. Hell, I'm not sure there was much of a plan. All I know is that Saturday night around 8 p.m., all was quiet. And then the cars started coming. Five at first, then 15, then 20. Next thing I knew, the entire road was full of cars and teenagers. Hell, it seemed every kid for 75 miles was at that house. Music blasting, and the minute I walked outside, I could feel it. Something was mad, pissed off, and this was not going to be good at all. So I rode up to the house, and it was chaos. Kids all over the front yard, parked on the lawn, drinking and acting a fool. I had never seen any of these kids in my life. I worked my way inside, and Warren was nowhere to be found. But that little heifer of a girlfriend of his, Amanda, was right there in the living room. I asked her where Warren was, and she said he was feeling sick and went to the bathroom. I went to the bathroom and found him vomiting in the toilet. I said to Warren, you know these kids can't be here, what are you doing? He looked up and said, it's cool, as long as no one goes in the back, they will be fine. We explained that to them. I told him, clean yourself up and get out here and get rid of these kids before something bad happens, son, and do it now. This look came over his face, you know, that look your kid gets when they know they've messed it up. And he said, why can't I just be normal? Have some friends over, it's not fair. Looking at him, I understood I really did, but hell, life is not fair. I told him as much. That life is not fair and you can't run from things by trying to be like everyone else. As the two of us were going back and forth, I heard Amanda saying, oh my God, Look how much space is back here. And I knew in that moment that she was going out on the backside of the house. I grabbed Warren and we headed out the door, only to discover kids piling out the back door and into the open field. Listen, I didn't know what would happen, but I knew it would be something terrible. We stepped outside and told the kids they needed to go back into the house, but they wouldn't listen. Kids being kids, it took about 30 minutes before we could quarrel them and get them back into the house and then out the front door. This party wasn't going to stop, so I called the law. I told them what was going on and where and that they needed to come before someone got hurt. Five minutes later, four sheriff cars pulled up and helped disperse the crowd. The sheriff at the time was absolutely pissed with Warren. He grabbed him by the shirt and said, Now son, you know you can't have these kids around here. You know how dangerous it is. Warren knew good and well how bad the situation could turn out, but he was longing for the attention of his peers. He wasn't disrespectful at all, and we stood there while everyone dispersed. Well, the cars left, and we noticed that there were three cars still remaining. One was the car that Amanda and her best friend came in, and the other two cars no one knew who drove them. It was right then and there I got this sinking feeling in my stomach. I knew it, somehow I just knew it. Five of them had gone into the woods. When the realization hit that they were missing, there was no considering anything else other than that they had gone into the woods. So, we headed to the backside of the house and this was when Amanda came to realize that what people heard about these woods was true because we were back there. The sheriff was coming up with a plan of action when she looked into the woods and said she saw her grandmother. 
Stop, pause, understand that her grandmother was dead. Looking in that direction, I didn't see a thing and neither did anyone else. It was dead quiet outside, and that silence was broken by the telephone ringing inside the house. Warren was now trying to explain to Amanda that whatever she was seeing was not her grandmother, and I'm going inside to get the phone. When I answered, it was my wife telling me that there were two boys at the back door, scared out of their minds. I told her to hold them there, and I'm on my way. So now I'm racing out of the house to my truck and back down to my place. When I get there, these two young men are laying on the ground, having panic attacks, hyperventilating. I ask them what is wrong, and they tell me that they went into the woods, and then they don't know what happened. Now, one of the sheriffs is coming through my back door, and he takes over, talking to them. It takes him five minutes to get them to give us the first clue of what happened. They heard about the place and just wanted to see, so they went into the woods, and according to them, they only went 50 yards in. They could still see the light of the house, and then it just went dark. Looking around, they were lost. So they decided to walk in, holding hands, and then they heard growling and laughter. Voices coming from the trees saying, You have been found wanting. One kid says, I was holding her hand and she was yanked away from me. That is how we found out a girl had gone into the woods with them. But wait, it gets even more crazy. We now knew we needed to get into the woods as fast as possible, so I grabbed my shotgun and flashlight and went. The sheriff circled back and regrouped with everyone else, and they went in from Liz's house. Now I'm alone, walking. The further I get away from the house, the worse the feeling gets like I'm working my way into enemy territory. And that's when I hear, is someone there? It's a male voice. Shining my light, it's this kid up in a tree, way up in a tree. I say, son, get down, we have to go right now. He just shakes his head no and points. I shine the light in the direction he is pointing, and standing there less than 50 feet away is this freaking wolf standing on its hind legs, massive shoulders, and it's looking at me with this look of anger on its face like I just caused it a problem. You are not taking these kids, I say. Do you hear me? It looks up at the kid and then back at me, and now I have the shotgun pointed at it. It looks at the gun and grins like, what is that going to do to me? And this fear starts to hit me. When I say it hit me, it's like, I get punched in the chest with fear, and it's trying to drill its way into my body. I know this is going to sound crazy, but it was like it projected that fear right at my heart. In that moment, I knew it, I felt it, and I refused to be afraid. Now, refusal to be afraid and feeling fear are two different things. There was a reason to feel fear. It was dark, this is a monster, but being made afraid was a choice, and I knew that. So I looked at it and said, you have until I count to three to leave and find those other kids and bring them back to this spot, or I will empty every bullet in this gun and call for every angel in heaven to chase after you and give you no rest ever. That grin stops and it has this serious look, like it's contemplating what to do and then it takes one step and I hear it running off. What was crazy about the situation was it seemed brighter out when it was gone, like its presence was blocking out the light itself. Looking back up to the tree, the boy was climbing down. When I asked him about his friends, he said, everyone separated, one was taken. So, I worked my way back to the house with him and then went back into the woods again. This time, it felt different. It felt like that darkness, that enemy territory was no longer there. So I pressed further and further, searching, looking. Stop and listen to what I'm about to say to you next. I'm positive no one has ever shared this with you. As I walked along, I heard that voice saying in my head, she is in the earth, she is in the earth. I had no clue what that meant at the time, never heard anything like it, but off in the distance I see flashlights, and it's the sheriff. Warren is with them, and he has this look of guilt on his face. They tell me they found the other boy, but there is still a girl missing and I ask Warren what it means that she's in the earth. This look comes across his face and he takes off running through the woods, screaming, follow me, understand. Now it's just me and Warren running at full speed. Now, I'm not sure if you have ever run in the woods at night, but it is not pleasant at all. There are branches smashing into your face and your shins take a beating as you move along. 
and we are running for like 10 minutes at full speed. When I see the lights from Liz's house in the distance and then we take a sharp right towards the creek. We go across the creek and up a hill. Now, my legs are burning as we go uphill and then the light from where Warren was running disappears. He was 15 feet ahead of me and now he is gone. I take a few more steps and I'm sliding downwards. Ahead of me, I see Warren's light when I reach the bottom. It's not a cave, it's more like a mound of earth. You can see the roots of trees above and Warren is now searching, digging in the dirt, moving earth around. He says, help me dig, she is here somewhere. So now I'm on my hands and knees, digging, looking, searching, when he says, I got her. Sure enough, I shine the light and he is pulling this girl from the soil. She is bare-chested and has dart all in her face, ease, hair, and she is barely breathing. We then have to drag her back out of this hole, a process that seemed like it took forever. The air was rank and had the stench of death. When we finally get her outside, it was like the open air revived her because she looks at us with eyes wide as baseballs and starts to scramble away, stands up, and takes off running and screaming. Warren has to literally tackle this girl to stop her from running back into the woods, and she is fighting for her life, kicking, punching, biting him. You can tell that this girl had been through it. He is holding her down, and I shine the light on my face and say, hey, we are trying to help you. Only then did she stop, and it was like instantly there was this emotional dump. She starts to cry and scream. Then she realizes she is bare-chested and starts to cover herself. I take off my shirt and give it to her, and we walk her back to Liz's house. It took days for the girl to talk. When I tell you she was mute as they questioned her, it was like the person that was inside her body retreated and hid away until it was safe to come out. That was just the start of the ramifications of the bad decision that Warren made. The woods came alive after that. There was no turning them back off. It was something that we were going to have to deal with. So we did, to the best of our ability. Then her parents tried to have her press charges. The sheriff came over to talk to me about it and his exact words were, who and what are we going to arrest? That was when I heard the story of what happened to her. Her name is Jewel, and when I learned what happened to her, it made my blood boil. It turns out that when everyone went into the woods, she was the only one apprehensive about it. According to her, 15 yards in, she knew it was evil back there. She saw what looked like 100 shadows moving among the trees, darting back and forth. She told them that after 45 feet, she wanted to go back. They literally grabbed her by the hand and pulled her into the woods. 50 yards in, she could see the darkness closing in from all sides. Then there was silence and darkness. The laughter, that's when they all realized something was wrong. So they started to make their way back, but darkness closed in. She described it like a wall of darkness. Then she heard talking, and when she looked at her friends, their eyes were glowing red. They all just ran off into the darkness. She felt herself being pulled, yanked violently away, and up into the air. Seconds later, she felt hands all over her body, touching her in private places as she floated through the trees, swinging wildly up and down. Then she was dropped from what felt like 20 feet in the air, and when she stood up, she was topless. Looking around, it was dark. She had no clue where she was. So she started walking in the direction she thought she heard talking. As she walked along, something pulled her by her hair, yanking her backward to the ground and started dragging her. She said at first she was afraid, but she knew she needed to fight. So she turned and twisted to get a look at what it was, and it didn't look human. She described it as having peeling human flesh, but beneath this, pale, hard skin. She described the process of hitting one of its legs with the other, tripping it, then crawling towards it and beating it with a rock. She couldn't get to the upper body, so she hit it as hard as she could in the waist, hips, and legs. According to Jewel, it started to bleed. She could feel the moisture from it. Then she was snatched again, this time by something stronger, hit in the head, 
and all she remembered was me shining the light in her face. The sheriff had her take a medical examination after Jewel said she felt like she'd been violated, and she was. I'm sure you are wondering how this all played out. It didn't go well. You see, her parents didn't believe the story. It turned out that they had their own ideas of what happened. That someone in the woods did this to her, a person. The sheriff was involved, and he even explained what he saw and encountered. But her dad insisted that someone had violated his daughter. It was a few weeks after the situation that he popped up at Liz's house looking for answers, angry, hurt, and confused. The man was on the edge of going nuclear, and it was understandable. Warren called me to come up to the house. Initially, he blamed Warren, you know, for having the party in the first place. Warren agreed and apologized, saying, Sir, I'm sorry, I never imagined that anyone would get hurt. As he stood there, I noticed he was printing, had a gun under his shirt. So I tell him, listen, I'm not sure what you came here to do, what you expect to accomplish, but this is not the way. There are things in those woods that cannot be explained. As all this conversation is going on, Liz is over in the corner mumbling to herself, and all of a sudden she says, this is not like what happened to your sister. I see it now. You were a kid then. There was no way you could have protected her. Honey, you have been carrying that weight your entire life. That is not fair. The man who did that to her is dead. God took him when you asked him to. She stands up and walks over to him, touches him on his shoulder, and hugs him. Listen, I don't know if you have ever seen a person experience a word of knowledge from God. That was my first time. I watched what looked like years of shame and anger fall off that man because he starts to cry, and snot comes out of his eyes, his ears, his nose. As she hugs him, he hyperventilates and falls to his knees, crying uncontrollably for 15 minutes. Liz somehow gets down on the floor with him and holds him, a complete stranger. She looks up at us and waves us off. An hour later, Liz calls for me and Warren. We were out back talking, and she says, Now, I have explained to Norman here what is back there in the woods, and he wants retribution. He has a right to it. However, he can't do it. Take him there, and he is going to read what I wrote down for him to read. Then y'all leave. Okay. Looking at Norman, the poor guy was a mess. Clothes all messed up, hair a mess, but he was determined to go deal with it. So we walk into the woods, and he pulls out a piece of paper and starts to read. I speak these words from my exalted body, standing in heavenly places with my Savior Christ Jesus. I bind every principality, power, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. In the name of Jesus Christ, you shall not touch my family or my bloodline. According to God's word, you shall not come nigh to my dwelling. I petition for warring angels of the Lord to strike down whatever touched my child. As these words come out of his mouth, the tears start to flow again. He struggles for a moment and then he says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Lord, something wicked has touched your heritage and your reward. I ask that you, the mighty man of war, make war and strike down what had done so. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, I knew in that moment something was about to happen. You could feel it. We head back to the house, and we are about to go inside. And Norman says, I think I'm supposed to be outside alone for a second. I'll be fine. We leave him at the back door and go inside to get some water, and then thunder, the loudest thunder I have ever heard. I want to be clear that there were no storm clouds in the sky, but after that thunder it rained for two days, and we saw the most miraculous lightning in the sky I have ever seen. That was the first time I saw the lightning that Warren told me about. Lightnings that went horizontally back and forth through the woods, darting around trees, slicing through them. It was an amazing sight. Norman took a liking to Warren, and the next thing I knew, Jewel and Warren were a thing. Then, tragedy struck, shaking us all to our cores as Warren called me one Saturday morning and said that Liz would not wake up. We called the ambulance and rushed to the house only to find her dead, smiling from ear to ear. She had her hand resting on the open Bible, open to a highlighted section, Nehemiah 9, 6. 
You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows down before you. Have you ever been happy and sad at the same time? It's the juxtaposition of the feeling that made these days so difficult. I was thankful, yet hurt, happy, yet sad. However, through it all, I had peace knowing where Liz was, no doubt in anyone's mind when it came to her. Then the funeral came, and it was massive. People from all over the place, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, all descended on our little town for Liz. The stories that came afterward, pastors she would pray for on the phone, who had accidentally dialed her phone number, and she told them God wanted her to talk to them. Hardcore gangsters from Shreveport that tried to rob her, and she told them what she saw around them, and they dropped their guns when they saw 15-foot-tall angels. Then she gave them money anyway and made them promise to call and talk to her. You never really know a person's life until they die. It is in that moment that the rich tapestry of the events is laid before our eyes for all to see.